if you think the spirit is one of those things that just lays there and doesn't do anything, you got it wrong. It's a living right. spirit. It's a living spirit. And it brings life to us. Amen. 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 And this it's it's been said, I don't know how many times a day, but I'm gonna say it one more time. Should have been here last night. We're glad to be here today. We're having a good time today. But if you yes. missed last night, something very important took place here on last night. All right. And, and we don't want to just brush by it as if it was just, oh, that was just another happening. So I'm, I'm going to I'm going to just want to include that into what we're doing here today. All right. I want to ask if you've got your Bibles, if you will, turn with me to our scripture, which is Acts 16. So I'm going to read a little fast. If you just read along with me. Acts 16. We're going to start the 16th verse. And read from verse 31. I may take a pause in here while we're doing this. So just read, hang in there with me. Amen? Amen. I wish you had been here last night because the kids sang. And they sang. And they sang. And when they got through, they broke some chains. So let's read this but see what the word says about that. Amen? This is Paul, right? He said, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. In other words, she was Miss Ruth. She made money by reading your palm and telling you what the future had to hold for you. And it wasn't her money, because see, then women didn't own money. She made money for somebody else. Yeah. Uh, so when the, then they came into the city, this woman met them. The same woman, Paul says, the same followed Paul and us in Christ, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us unto us the way of salvation. Even though she was a soothsayer, a palm reader, a fortune teller, she had enough sense to know these were men of God. These were the men, and she followed them, and she hollered out, These are the men of God. Now, you think the men of God can't get irritated. Well, let's read on. And it said, And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he came out of her the same hour. Yeah. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they couldn't make any more money. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful to us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast with stocks put chains on the feet. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. All right. Let's read that again on verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were loose. Yes. Can someone say the chains were broken? Chains the were broken. chains were broken. See, we didn't just make that up in 2014. The word all says right. they sang and they praised and the chains were broken. Amen? Amen. Amen. And the keeper of the prison awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open and drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Amen. And thy house. Amen. Let us Amen. pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that we have learned already before the word goes forth that we know how to sing and praise and pray unto you. 
and that our praise and our prayer and our singing just breaks the chains even where we are. Lord God, we thank you for what happened on last night. We thank you for what you're doing today, and we thank you in advance for what's coming up in this week and weeks to come. Lord God, continue to have your way in this house. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Let every heart say amen. 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 What must I do to be saved? See, we, we hear that statement a lot. What must I do to be saved? And I chose, for those that need a topic, I chose for my topic today, tornadoes and termites. Tornadoes and termites. Tornadoes and termites. What must I do? See, salvation has long been the topic for everyone that confessed to be a born-again Christian. We talk right. about salvation and how I'm going to be saved and I was saved and you wasn't there you don't know, you don't know when, you don't know where. We hear all that. God's chosen people, before Christ came along, God's chosen people had been given a set of rules. Matter of fact, the first five books of the Bible, called the Torah, the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible were just basically a lot of rules. It's got some heritage in there, generations, and some things that God did miraculously, brought them out of Egypt. But it's filled with the rules, the do's and the don'ts. As a matter of fact, our top ten are found in there in All Exodus right. 20. Anybody familiar with those? The All Ten right. Commandments. See, and we know those. Ten, thou shalt not. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not. Don't steal. Yeah. People don't lie. Don't commit adultery. Mm -hmm. Don't cut it. All right. It's, it's ten of them in there. And we got those. We got those. But then they went on. They, they had even more. They had come up with then the seven deadly sins. Mm -hmm. Our seven deadly sins are found in Proverbs 6 and 16. It says, I'll give these to you. It says, there are six things the Lord hates. In fact, he hates even seven things. The Lord hates proud eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that kill those that aren't guilty. He also hates hearts that make evil plans, feet that are quick to evil, and any witness who pours out lies, and anyone who stirs up family fights. So anyone right. who stirs up strife among the brothers. See, the, new, the NIV says family strife. We know it's among the brothers. We're family. So they told us that the Lord hates anyone who stirs with strife, even among us. So now we're getting into what these things are. What must I do to be saved? All right. And he's given us these ten commandments. Lots of other laws. What we should eat, what we should wear, how we should wear our hair, where we should walk, what we should do on certain days of the week. There was nothing but rules and laws. And it was laid out pretty clearly, pretty plainly for anyone who said, I want to be a believer. All right. As a matter of fact, we can come on into the New Testament. Paul gave us still another list of what we call the bad sins. Paul gave us this one. Paul says, and it's in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, it says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts, wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, even, I'm sorry, envy, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So now we've got these real concrete lists, what we have to do to be saved. And at that point, you know what, Christians? We thought we had it in the bag because it was just laid out, cut and dry, point blank. What must I do to be saved? This man even asked it then. What must I do to be saved? If you ask many of us today what you must do to be saved, we'll go back to these same lists. We'll go back to the same list of, well, don't lie, don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't bear false witness, don't covet what your neighbor has. We go back to that. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. We got all of those. And we think that's what I do to be saved, right? Well, there was a problem. These are the big sins. These are the big, the big. And I, I chose to call these the tornadoes. All right. See, we, we know how to prepare for the tornado. Uh -huh. We come to church every Sunday. We come to Bible study. We have prayer. We do Sunday school. What are we doing? We're preparing for the tornado. All right. See, just like the, the, the community has the signals that are warning us when a tornado's coming, and in the school they have you to go out through the hall, and, and, and what you do? You bend down, and you put your head between your knees, and you get all ready because the tornado's coming. We know what to do to be safe in case of a tornado in the natural. Well, you know what? We've learned what to do to avoid tornadoes, even in the spirit. Right. Not many of 
us are in here going to go out today and commit murder. All right. Not many. I doubt any. Well. I don't think any of us are going to leave here today and go to Walmart and steal something. All right. I don't think so. I think we've mastered the tornadoes. We know how to avoid the tornadoes. We hear the sirens coming and we know, uh-oh, trouble. But what has now happened, there's something smaller than a tornado that happens to us. All right. I just want to share, this is just a little statistic. This was from uh, last year. It says there are over 1,200 1, tornadoes that strike every year uh -huh. in this country. 1,200 tornadoes. And they cost about four thousand, I mean, $4 billion in damage. Right? About $4 billion a year from tornadoes. That's pretty, I don't have $4 billion. All right. Billion. All right. But that's pretty expensive. Tornadoes. And yet we've learned how to avoid them. And even in our lives, those large sins cost us abundantly. But now, there's something else. Solomon gave us a little insight to something. In the second book of the um, Song of Solomon, he wrote this. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. For our vines have tender grapes. Now, we condense that when we use it. We say what? The small foxes destroy the vine. The small foxes destroy the vine. He calls them foxes. I chose to call them termites. Uh, See, we've got these tornadoes that will come through and blow down a house in a matter of seconds uh, and be gone. It may never, ever, ever come back your way again. But termites, uh, on the other hand, uh, there's not a warning signal that's going to go through the air to alert you that there is a termite in your house. All right. There is no evacuation plan in place for you to go when termites strike your house. Uh -huh. They don't have any exercises at the school for the kids to go through to prepare themselves for the termites. However, where the tornadoes usually come in a season, termites are year-round. Right. Uh, a tornado will last for a few moments. A, tor a termite eats 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop, chewing at the foundation of your house. All right. That's the termite. Yeah. But yet we have not prepared for the termite in the natural, let alone in the spiritual. All right. Now, are there some spiritual termites? Yeah, there are. You know, and I'm going to use an illustration because I, I, I always want to make sure that the kids are staying with me because I know I get right. metaphorical. But now, my young people, it's like this. There was a third grader that I was reminded of who had a final exam coming up before going on to the fourth grade. And it was a spelling exam. And he had done pretty good all year long. And he knew 50% of his grade depended on this test. This was the final exam, and it was 50%. The teacher explained it very clearly. You have to be here at 9 o'clock. Do not be late. I will close the door at 9 o'clock. You will start the test at 9 o'clock. At 9 o'clock, there is no talking, walking. There are no questions. You will only take the test, and when you're done, you turn it in. All right. Now, this little kid's name was Dewan. He decided, I'm going to pass this test with all A's. He studied. He studied. He went home, and he went over every word on his list, and he spelled them frontward and backwards and knew what they meant and did not miss a one. Mom was so excited. She all said, right. Dewan's going to blow this one out of the water. Made sure he had his books, backpack, pencils, everything ready to go. Ready? On the bus and all. Got the school in class at 9 o'clock. Matter of fact, first one in the room, in his seat, because he was ready to go. 9 o'clock came, the door closed. The teacher said, turn over your test. And they did. And the test began. That evening, Dewan came home. Didn't look too good. Mom said, what happened? I said, well, I made a zero. Mm. Wow. How do you make a zero when you spelled every word right? It was, he said, I forgot to sharpen my pencil. And I couldn't get up. The small fox, the small fox destroyed his vine. He knew every answer. We're like that in the church now. See, some of us first run through the door when the church door opens. All right. We're here every time the lights click on. We got uh, Bible told and spiritual quoting. All we can right. tell you what thus say the Lord from the beginning to the end. I've read my Bible seven times from cover to cover, front to back. I know them all. Mm -hmm. I wear the longest skirts in church and the biggest, highest hats. I got it all together. Mm -hmm. The tornadoes. Mm -hmm. But now what would be what did Paul say about this? 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I, I just like the way he put this because it spoke so clearly to me now. Talking about breaking those chains. Paul said in chapter 13, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. In other words, I'm nothing. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I'm still nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profited me nothing. All right. Nothing. So now we're talking about the termites. See, Paul was one saying, you know, there are those that say, you know what? I don't kill, I don't steal, I don't do any of those things that the law say don't, I don't do it all. I got it all together, look at me. And as they tug on their coat and say, I'm ready. And Paul says, you know what? Though you do all those things, you got termites. All right. What termite is that? That's a termite called lack of love. Lack of, anybody can follow the rules. I follow the rules when I'm driving up down the road. I'll do 55, but that don't mean I'm in love with the sheriff's department. All right. You don't have to have love to follow the rules. That's what Christ was trying to show us, was that there's more to it than just reading the word and following the rules. There's an element called love, and that's one of those termites. So we're ready for the tornado, but we miss the termites. Yes, See, there's different types of termites. You know, there's lots of species. There's some little red ones, there's some little white ones, there's some big ones. I mean, but they all do the same thing. And just like there's lots of types of termites, Guess what? There's different types of spiritual termites. If we look at Hebrews 11, verse 6, this, this is a familiar scripture. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So not only is it with that with love, I'm nothing, but now without faith, it's impossible. And don't be fooled. Don't think because you see somebody in church every Sunday morning saying hallelujah, hallelujah, that they have faith. All right. Don't, All don't right. be fooled by that, brother. Yes. Don't be fooled. Because see, a lot of us are not so faithful that I'm going to heaven. Some of us just don't want to go to heaven. All right. And that's just plain point. Like, see, it's true. I, I'm not sure that it's something over there. But just in case, All right. I better do this thing because I don't want to wake up one day on the wrong side of the water. All right. That's not faith. That's called uh, almost some insurance. Uh -huh. Faith is, I know that I know that I know that my Redeemer lives. Yes. Right. That is faith. And the Bible tells us that without faith, it's impossible. So I don't care if you didn't kill nobody, you didn't steal nothing, you didn't commit adultery, you didn't do any of the don't do. If you don't have faith, is it possible? It's still not possible. So that's another termite that was there on the scene. Jesus picked it up too. See, that was the problem with Jesus. He was, a, he was a Jew. But, and he had these same rules that came down, the first five books of the Bible, the same rules, but yet, now here he's coming with some new talk, a new thing. Uh -huh. Now Jesus said it like this in Matthew 25. He said, first, I'm starting at verse 32, he said, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did, when did we see you hungry and feed thee? Or thirsty and gave thee drink. When we saw thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee. Or when we saw thee sick or in prison and came unto thee. And the king shall answer them and say, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye did it unto me. Unto me. I read through that and I didn't see one spot where Jesus said, You didn't kill anybody. You didn't steal from nobody. You didn't tell a lie on nobody. But Jesus said these are the attributes of caring about one another. Not just the big man. He said the least of these. Yesterday, um, um, this week, when I was sitting in the back with the kids, and, and, and they bought out the food, and, and, and it fell. Now, sometimes we think, well, that's just, that's just consequential. That just goes along with it, just to feed, just to feed the kids. 
Let me tell you something. That wasn't consequential. Right. That was not consequential. I ate that on, on, on Friday. And I was hungry. I was hungry. And I was not hungry by choice. Now, I didn't come in here going, y'all, I'm sure you're hungry. No, I didn't do that. I came here hungry. Why? And I didn't miss breakfast by choice. I missed breakfast because when I opened my refrigerator, there were no more eggs. There was no milk. There was no butter. There was no nothing. I was like, well, what's going on anyway? I'm not going to stay home because I'm hungry. And when I got here, and they fed me. They, fed, they did what the word said. They fed someone who was hungry. You never know who you're blessing when you're acting in accordance with the word of God. We can't just pick and choose like, oh yeah, there, there's somebody over there I need to give something to. You don't know who is in need of a blessing. I say it all the time. I thank God I don't look like what I've been through. I thank God I don't look like what I'm going through. So we don't look at one another and decide, oh yeah, you're the one I'll bless. You're the one I'll do something. Oh yeah, I'll give it to you. We don't look at our brothers on the outside and our sisters on the outside. We let the spirit lead us. Because yesterday on Friday, they fed a hungry man. And I have to thank God. Sister Lepid, I'm going to tell her, thank you. Because that was what I ate on that Friday. Was that chicken sandwich, those carrots, and I enjoyed every bit of them. <laughs> every bit of them. They were wonderful. Wonderful. So these are the things that we're looking at as termites that we have overlooked for a long, a long time. Wow. We always know that I grew up in a I grew up in a church that just abided by every every rule. Every rule. Never ate pork in my life. Why? Because it said in the Bible, don't eat pork. So I never had it. Wow. So I tell anybody else. But that was just me. That's the way we grew every rule in the book we had to live by. But we missed something. When I go back now and I see my family and I see the strife. Mm, come on. When I see the confusion. Right. When I see people who I knew as family who just don't even care about one another. Yeah. I'm wondering, what happened? Are we in the same book? I, you know, yeah. Is there something different? They've got termites. They watched out for the tornadoes. Those things come a certain time of year once in a while. Termites every day. All right. Every day. Yeah. Every day. We've got to watch out for our <coughs> termites. Those little things yeah. that destroy the vine. You know, there's a lot of knowledge that we get. Wisdom is that thing that tells us when to use the knowledge. Wisdom was that pencil that that little boy didn't have in school. He had the knowledge, he just had no way to apply it. Wow. He had no pencil. We've got to make sure we have our spiritual pencil. All right. So don't just get caught up on, I don't, you know, I didn't lie, I didn't tell, I, those are your tornadoes. Thank God we know how to block So They build houses better now for those. Yeah. But now we know that we have termites that we now look out for. Termites and tornadoes have destroyed a lot of spots. When I think of um, tornadoes and termites, I think both naturally and in the spirit. In Psalms, there's a, there's a scripture that says, I speak of them in the spiritual, I envision them. And it says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Now I say that to say that I'm not trying to mislead anyone. I do not want anyone to think I'm telling you what you do to get saved. All right. How you earn your way in the kingdom. If you think I love everybody, I've got all faith, I'm charitable, I'm taking care of the hungry, I'm visiting the sick, I'm going to the prison, I've done, I've done everything, Lord. I've done it all. Wow. I've done it all. I have now earned my seat front row heaven. Right. I've got my seat my ticket is stamped and sealed. I've got it. But don't let me mislead you to think that that happens because, brothers and sisters, it does not happen that way. As a matter of fact, you cannot work your way into heaven. There's nothing you can do to earn your way into heaven. Now, there is, on the other hand, there's some things you can do to guarantee a seat in hell. So let's not confuse the two. But there's nothing you can do that will earn you that seat in heaven. I'm reminded of a little short story of two men that decided they wanted to jump the Grand Canyon. They were going to just, you know, that was just their feet. Y'all familiar with the Grand Canyon, young people? Y'all know what the Grand Canyon is? Okay. These two men decided to jump the Grand Canyon. So the one decided, I'm going to get in shape. He's working out, doing squat thrusts, using weights. He's eating broccoli and, and all kinds of vegetables, getting his sleep and stretching. And he's, you know, he's building up. He has six months to prepare for this jumping of the Grand Canyon. The other man said, I'm just going to do it. 
I don't need to do all that. I'm just going to go jump the Grand Canyon. All so right. the day came. Time to jump the Grand Canyon. The first man went out there, the one that had not prepared. And he went and got him a running start, and he leaped out and splat. Well, well. We didn't expect him to make it anyhow. Second man said, okay, and I'm going to show you how it's done. I've been preparing for this. I've done all the right things. He went and got him a good running start. I mean, a good start. And he took off and he flew off that edge and splat. Well, well. He didn't make it either. That's how it is with our works in trying to reach God. Uh -huh. We cannot possibly work enough to reach heaven. It is impossible. It is impossible. We do our best. We do our very best, and the only way that we get there is through eliminating another one of those termites, and that is called accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. All right. See, that wasn't back in the law. That wasn't in the Ten Commandments. You won't find that in Exodus. You won't find it in Leviticus. You won't find it back then. So these people that came along through all that, and then even some today, still believe, well, we don't need to accept a Jesus Christ. That's a termite. That's a little termite that is eating away, eating away, eating away. We know that it is not because of our works that we are saved, but it's because of the love and the blood of Jesus Christ. When God looks at us, he doesn't look at us as who we are. He looks at us through the lens of his son. He looks at us through the lens of the one that he gave to die in our place. He looks at us as a home that has neither termites nor tornadoes in it. He looks at us as a perfect building. He says, except the Lord built the house. Right. If I'm building this house, I can do all I want to because I'm building it. I don't care how much I do to it. If I built it, well, it's going right. to fall. Yeah. Right. And I don't care how much I try to protect it. If I'm waking up, I'm going to defend myself with my gun. I'm going to get taken out. All right. He said, the, way, the watchman waketh, but in vain. I told someone the other day, he said, he said I want to get a gun. I said, well, you know, the Bible says live by the, live by the sword, die by the sword. And I said, if you look at it, people that get killed are not people without guns. They're the people with the guns. I said, 54, I've never been shot or even shot at. But I know a lot of people with guns who get shot at all the time. So let's think about that. It's not your gun that's protecting you. It's not the knife that's protecting you. It's our God that protects us. It's our God that keeps us. It's that that keeps us going from day to day. We have got, brothers and sisters, we have got to be aware of those termites. Yes, yes. I know the tornadoes come with loud sounds and, and warnings, and we, we are all aware of them. You can see them coming a mile away. We could drive down the street, and I can see somebody on track. And I go, yeah, they're going way down. I can see them from here. Tornado, that, that spirit of addiction got. But can we see the termites in our own home? Can we see the termites in our own spirit? The little bitty things that are destroying destroying, destroying our body. You know, I, I, I saw this illustration in my mind this morning on my way to church. I said, you know, when, when Christ said, I'm going to divide on the left, so I'm on, the left, on my left hand and on my right hand. You know, as he began to talk, he was talking to the believers. All right. Talking to the believers. Yes, sir. And he was telling them, now you, you, you saw me hungry, you saw me naked, you saw me sick, in prison, you checked on me, you saw about me, you took care of me. These others over here, I said, but we, we didn't do all that? They were surprised. You know, why would he have to tell the believers that? Well, it's kind of like this. When you go to Walmart and you get 35 items, let me say 45 items, and you get the 10 item or uh, uh, less line, don't be surprised when they tell you you're in the wrong line. All right. And you're not surprised. You, you realize I got more than 10. I'm going to go over here to my line. I'm not surprised. But what happened was, there were some that figured, well, I just got 12 items, All right. so I'm getting this line. I'm going to stand right here. And they get there, the rest and say, no, you've got too many. You're in the wrong line. That's what happens to the believers who don't watch out for the termites. We think because I did all this, pastor, I was in church, all right. I paid my tithe, I paid my offering, I went to every meeting that you told me to go to, I wore all the right clothes, I said hallelujah in all the right places, I did it. All right. I drove all right. a church truck, I, I, whatever, I did it. And they get there and go, but you're in the wrong line. All right. You're in the wrong line. We're surprised. What? You're in the wrong line. Your termites got you. That's the same scenario. He's talking to us as believers, and he's trying to warn us. Don't just look at the big picture, those big things. Be aware. Show love. 
Show compassion. Mm -hmm. Help one another. Help those that you think they may not even need help. Don't be afraid to just reach out to someone, and if they turn it down, that's on them. Right. But we have got to step on up to the plate and be the Christians that Christ has called us to be. He's laid it out pretty clear. Yeah. He's laid it out very clear. We have mastered the law. He came to fulfill the law. Amen. Amen. He didn't do away with it. It's still there. Yeah. But he figured by now, y'all have.